Guilt, shame, and remorse are powerful emotions. The reality, I think we've all struggled with these. In fact, I think many of us are probably struggling with these even to today. But we all struggle, but at the same time, we have a hard time understanding. I think one of the reasons that we have such a hard time understanding this, even in our own lives, is that it's something that we all struggle with, but we also all hide. And because we hide it, we never try to understand it. I think one of the best ways to understand the true nature of our guilt and our shame is to, uh, to look at the, the effects that it has on children. Because I think when I think about guilt and shame, the big difference between adults and children is children just haven't learned to hide it very well. So what you see is it, its natural state. I think about that with my own kids. I mean, I would have, you know, if one of my kids would do something, if they did something and I wasn't home and, and Sandy would correct them on them, you know, especially in a couple of them, I mean, their first response would always be, don't tell dad, don't tell dad. You know, no, no, we got to tell dad. And then I would come home, and I wouldn't, if I didn't know anything that happened, I'd come home and I could tell something was wrong. Because I have a child that's kind of hiding from me, a, a child who's distant. But because they, they know that there's something that is there, and they feel this guilt and shame, and they're cut off from that relationship. They're hiding. They're, they're, they're staying away from me. And, uh, and, and that's what you see. You see guilt and shame. You see something that is there that is causing a break in that relationship that is causing them shame, and you see a consequence. See, we see that very obviously in children, but because we hide it ourselves, it's something that's less obvious in ourselves. See, countless people struggle with it. Every week it seems like I talk to someone else who's dealing with, with these feelings of guilt and shame in one way. We're haunted by them. You know, some people will come and they'll admit, boy, I'm, I was hesitant to even come to church because, you know, I don't feel like I belong here. Other people that they're there and they, well, they'll come to church, but, but they're afraid that if anybody really knew the real them, they would cert certainly be rejected. I've had people even tell me, well, here's my secret, and, and, I, and I respect them and honor, you know, I'm honored that they would tell me their secret, but they'll say, well, here's my secret, you need to know, but don't tell anybody else because they're just afraid that if anybody knew the real them, if anybody knew the real story, no one would love them, no one would accept them. Or there are others that I talk to and, and they're haunted by these feelings of guilt over, over years or decades, over things that were done you know, a long time ago. And yet, you know, they've, they've said, well, I prayed about it, I've forgiven, but they're still haunted by that guilt. And, and they, they prayed about it one time, but they could barely even talk to God about it anymore because they still are haunted by this thing that they did, this, 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 this terrible thing, and, and they just can't forgive themselves. What I want you to realize is that there is a cure. And the world doesn't offer a cure. They, you know, we'll, they'll say, go to counseling, and it's just kind of covering up the problem. It isn't really dealing with it. But there is a cure before God. It's not just denying the feelings. It's not just ignoring them. It's a true cure. But it's to understand that, just as in the principle of, true, of any medicine, before we, we get to the cure, we've got to understand you know, the problem. We've got to understand what it means to be healthy and where we've gotten sick to be able to understand the cure. And all of that goes all the way back to creation. Uh, this is something that we've seen again and again because everything that he has been saying in Colossians up till this point is building on a point and is building on a foundational principle that the idea that we are created for God and by God. Colossians 1, chapter, uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created, things in, things in heaven, on an earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And here's the principle, is that we were created for relationship with God. If we're going to be healthy, we've got to realize that's the picture of health. We need that in our lives. He's not, Jesus isn't just the creator of everything in the world, but when he created us, we are created for him. We are created for relationship with him. God has given us this God-shaped vacuum at the core of our heart, as we've talked about you know, you know, before, that there's this, this core-shaped vacuum. And when we have a relationship with God, our life works. When we don't, we'll try to put something in there because there's, there's a hole, there's something that we know is missing. And we try to find something that will work and and it will satisfy for a moment, but ultimately it will let us down. See, that's what Paul says, again, when we looked at that verse a minute ago. 
All things were created through him and for him. His before all things, and him all things hold together. When we understand that, when we have God in that shape vacuum, because that's what we're created for, things work. And when we don't have God there, things don't hold together. You know, our life gets out of, out of, out of whack, and it you know, wobbles. It, 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 things break apart. And, and you know, it's, when Christ is there, everything makes more sense. Our marriage works better. Our, our finances work better. Our work, because we have God at the center. We have him there, and everything falls out from him. But when we have something else there, then, you know, then everything else is out of whack. And so, so that's what he's saying. Now, that's the whole theme of Colossians 1 and 2. Again and again, he says that we rec- if we recognize this, then it's only when we find a relationship in him and our identity is in him that life will work. Let me just briefly go over. I want you to hear how re- repeatedly he says this again and again. Colossians 1.14, he says, In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption. Verse 16, in him all things were created. Verse 19, in him was all the fullness of God pleased to dwell. Verse 22, we are reconciled in, in his body, in Christ, in his body of flesh. In verse 27, Paul describes what he calls the riches of the glory of this majesty or mystery. And he says, that, what is it? It's Christ in you, that we have this relationship with him. We go to Colossians 2. Paul says that it's in Christ in whom all things are hidden in the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 7, we're charged to walk in him. Then we're called to be rooted and built up in him. Verse 11, we're called to be filled in him. Verse 11, we're called to be circumcised in him. Verse 12, we're called to be raised up in him. Verse 15, we're called to triumph over them in him. Now, do you get a common theme? You see what he's saying? It's in him. It's in a relationship with him. We are created for this relationship. And when we have that relationship in him, life works. And even for those who who understand what it means to be forgiven, he's saying again and again to again as believers, remember it's in him. Are we rooted in him? Is our identity in him? It's something that's vital. Now, now that's the principle. That's health. But then he comes back and he says in in everything that we said, that's what we're created for. But the problem is, is that we're created for this relationship, but it's broken. It's broken by sin, and it can only be restored by Christ. The problem is we're all sinners, and we've been cut off from that relationship we were created for. That's again what Paul says in Colossians 1.21, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. See, we were created for this relationship, but now we're alienated by our sin. We're cut off. Our natural state, all of us, because of our sin, is we're alienated from God, and we can't fix it. We will try to fix it. Man's attempt to try to fix it is religion. That's our way of trying to work our way towards God, reach up and try to close the gap. And we cannot do it. And the gospel message is not about us, God saying, here's how you work your way towards God. Biblical Christianity says you agree that you can never work your way towards God, but it's a story of God coming down to us, of God coming down and reaching down to fix that which we could never fix. And that's the point that he continues to make. And that's where we come now to verse 13 of chapter 2, what we're going to study this morning. And what we see is that he teaches us what this now looks like. What does that cure look like when we accept that gift of God that he's given us through Jesus Christ? Verse 13, you were once dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God has made alive together with him. And what he teaches us is that we were spiritually dead, but in Christ we're made alive. Now, why do I, why do I say spiritually dead? That's kind of a harsh word. <laughs> You know, what, what, does, what does Paul mean by that? And why is it important? Think of it this way. If you're dead, what do you do to help make yourself better? What can you do? You know, even if you're, if you're flatlining and you're there, what can you do? I mean, if I'm, if I'm flatlining and the doctor says, oh, here, take this pill and it will make you better. I mean, I'm not going to be able to take it. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing that I can in, be involved with. Why? Because I'm dead. It's only external intervention. It's only CPR. It's only someone doing something from the outside that has any hope to revive me and give me a new life. Now, what Paul is saying is that we were dead. And that's the failure of religion. Religion is trying to say, here, take the pill. Jump through these hoops. Do this. You know, do this exercise. If you do enough of these things, then you'll, bring, you'll find life. That's what religion is. It's something, it's a system that's calling men to be a little better. And oftentimes it's saying, well, here's the rules. You know, if you keep the Sermon on the Mount, if you keep the Golden Rule, if you do all these things. 
But the problem is, is that it's trying to tell us how to be a better person. But if we're dead, we don't have the strength and ability to do it. I can't take the pill. I've got to have, be given life. Literally, I've got to be born again. And I've got to be given life so that I'm made alive anew. You know, all the time I hear people talk about, you know, what is it, you know, your relationship with God. And, and they'll talk in terms of what they try to do. I'm trying hard. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to do my best. Well, okay, is your best perfect? Is it good? You, okay, Sermon on the Mount, do you keep it perfectly? The problem is, is if we're honest, you know, all of us would have to admit that we're not good by our own standards. We don't match up to perfection by our own standards. All of us know that there's things that we should do that we don't and things that we shouldn't do that we do. That's by our own standards, let alone in God's standards. All of us know that we fall short. The Bible teaches that. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are dead spiritually, and no amount of religion can, can fix that. So that's when he said you were dead. Now the good news, it says you were dead, but we're made alive. There is hope. Now I want, I want to, to take a moment and say, you know, when I talk about this, you know, we live in a world where people don't like to talk about things like sin and things like that. Well, here's what you need to realize. Is that it says that we were dead. And that's not saying something that you were or that someone else had it. It's that we all were. I was there. Apart from Christ, the fact is, I was spiritually dead. If God gives me what I deserve apart from Christ, you know, what I do is I go straight to hell, don't pass go, don't collect $200. I mean, I'm, that's what I deserve. And so I'm not, I'm not saying this being judgmental. Of I'm saying this is who we all are apart from Christ. But that's who we are apart from Christ, but Christ came and he's given us the ability to be made alive. Now, the beautiful thing is that as we get into this, he de then defines through two incredible pictures of what this life looks like, how it happens. Look at what he continues on. He says, you know, that we were guilty and condemned, but in Christ we're forgiven. Now, and he gives us two incredible word pictures here in verse 14. And they're, they're beautiful word pictures. And to understand these pictures, we have to, again, first of all, understand the need. We need to understand our need of forgiveness. We need to understand the reality of our guilt. You see, again, we live in a world where it's politically incorrect to talk about sin. If you talk about sin, you're being judgmental. But the Bible talks about sin. Jesus talks about sin a lot. I know some churches that, you know, they say, well, we're not going to use the word sin. That's too offensive for people. Well, that's the biblical word. Now, why is it important? It's important because that if we don't know our need, we will never be able to understand our salvation. If I, don't need to know, if I don't understand what I need to be saved from, I will never be able to understand what I'm saved to. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is, is talking, is, is there, and there's a bunch of religious leaders that start criticizing him because he's eating with tax collectors, the known sinners of his time, the people that everyone else looked down on. And, and they asked, you know, how, if you're a religious person, if you're a good God-following person, how could you eat dinner with these, these known sinners? And look what he says in verse 12. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now here, what we've got to realize, he's saying, you know, they're sick, so they need me to come to them. Now his point is not that the tax collectors and sinners needed Jesus because they're sick, and the religious people didn't need Jesus because they were healthy. Jesus' point that he's trying to make to them is that I've come because everybody is sick. But you know, these tax collectors and these sinners, they know that they're sick, so they've called the doctor. But you religious people, you don't even think that you're sick. You deny that. So, so the problem is you have some people that don't like to talk about sin because we don't want to admit our need. And we have to admit our need because the fact is, is that I'm a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. And until I understand how great of a sin I am, my, the depth of my need, I will never understand God's forgiveness. But on the other hand, there are some people that, that don't want to talk about it because we know that we've fallen short. And there's such a degree of shame over where we've fallen short in the past. You know, we feel like we cannot be, approach God. We can't come to him. We feel like, you know, you think about these tax collectors who the religious leaders said, stay away because you're bad. And there are some people who believe that and uh, stay away from Christ because we know that we're bad. And again, I, I can't tell you how many times over, over the years in pastoral ministry, I talk to people and they, they're burdened, they're haunted by guilt, by past failure. 
you know, they've done something so bad they feel like they can't, forgive, they can't forgive themselves. And if they can't forgive themselves, then how could God possibly forgive them? You know, people, as they grow older in the faith, they realize, boy, I failed here, I did this. I didn't realize it was bad, but man, I can't believe I did this. And we have events in our life. So many of us, if not all of us, have something that we look back and we said, boy, what's our deep regret? What's our, our shame, our guilt? And boy, we have this one thing that, man, we have a hard time getting over. There are things that we often can't talk to anybody else about. Our guilt is so deep that, that you know, there's such deep shame that we can't say anything and we're always afraid that someone else would find, it, find out because if they do, we're sure that they would reject us because we have a hard time accepting ourselves. Now, my friends, if you've ever felt that, if you're here today and you feel that, I want you to hear and understand the full nature of God's grace to you. Yeah, we have to talk about the full nature of our sin and our brokenness. We've got to understand our need to understand the, the, the solution. But I want you to now understand the full nature of the solution. The cure is pictured here in two pictures in verse 14. The first one is, is at the end of verse 13. Let's start there. He has, he's forgiven us our trespasses by canceling the debt, a record of debt that stood against us with its legal commands. And what it's teaching is that Jesus obliterates the record of our debt. Now, this is incredible. These pictures are just beautiful. Now, there's a couple words. If you have your Bibles open, keep them open. I'm going to point out there's a, there's, there's a couple words in this verse that are incredibly rich and that you might miss the, you know, the, the richness of its meaning just here in the English, and I need to draw these out a little bit. First of all, when he says he cancels the record of our debt, the wording here you know, that's translated record of our debt is one that refers to a record of debt or a promissory note which would be written in one's own hand. So it would be something that when you, you know, when you took out a loan, you would write in your own hand, I owe you this. When there would be something that would happen, you would write out. And he says it's not just a monetary debt, but that we've written in our own hand. In our own hand, we wrote, here's where I failed. Here's the debt that I have. You know, here's my shame. It's a handwritten note. It would refer usually to an IOU that acknowledges a debt that, that, uh, that is, you know, that a debt that is owned by a debtor to somebody else. And it says not only that, but there's a record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And so it's saying there's a record of debt that we've written, and that record of debt not only shows our debt, but there's legal demands. Because we owe that debt, there's, there's a price to be paid. There's a penalty to be paid. Well, and what is that? It's, these are, the debts are against the decrees of God. That here we have God that said, follow me, and we said, no, I want to do my own things. And we do our own things. We've walked away from him, and we have an obligation. And what is that obligation? Romans, the wages of sin is death. If we stand before God and I said, say, on my own, God, here is my sin, here is the record of my wrongs, and there is a debt to be paid for that, and it's death. Physical death and ultimately spiritual death that we're separated from God for all eternity. And when it says this, he says an incredible, interesting use of words that it's a, it's a record that we write by our own hands. This isn't something that someone else has accused us of. It isn't something that, you know, that, that other people have, have accused us or enemy has accused us. No, these are things that we have done in our own hands and our own action. And deep down, we know that we're guilty. Now, here's the beauty of it. It says what? That he, look at again the verse. He cancels the record of debt that stood against us with the demands. And the beauty is the word canceled. It's an incredibly strong word that means bought out if something was written on, on wax yeah, or, or, or on, on, with ink or wiped away if it was written on the wax. And it was, the idea was it obliterates the record. It totally destroys the record. So there's, there's no evidence of it anymore. Now, it's something that is a visual image. And as I thought about this, how do we visualize this? And we're blessed with Danny Mitchell as part of our church. And I explained it to me. He says, oh, I think I can do it on video. And here's this idea that is beautifully illustrated with a picture, and this is what Paul is trying to teach us here. We don't like it when people talk about sin, but we all know that we're sinners. There's a record against us. We can take our record and try to cross out our wrongs, the list of things that condemn us. But if we cross them out, we're always concerned that someone might be able to read it. Even if they can't read what was on our list, they can still tell that we've got a serious rap sheet. They can still tell that we're guilty. We still know that we're guilty. Colossians 2.14 teaches that Jesus cancels the record of our debt. 
It's a very strong word that literally means to wipe away, blot out, to obliterate the record. God doesn't cross out our wrongdoing. He totally blots out any record of our sin and condemnation. He obliterates the full record so that it isn't just hidden, it's made clean without a hint of a blemish. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that's, that's that, that, you know, what a blessing that we have, Danny. You know, when you look at that, you see that imagery. You know, because we sit there and we cross it out, and that's what we even think, well, I prayed to ask God, and, but deep down, we still look at it, and we still think that it's there, and somebody would see it, and we still see it. And what he's saying is that if you understand what Christ does at the cross, is that he takes that record that we've written, that we're guilty of, and we are, and it deserves a penalty, but he obliterates it. He doesn't just cross it off. You know, he pours the paint on it, and it's not just the paint. In this case, it's not paint. It's the blood of Jesus' Jesus Son. He pours the blood of Jesus Christ on it so that it is obliterated, and there is no evidence. You can't even see any marks anymore because we're totally made clean. We're made righteous. We're made holy. We're made blameless before our Lord. That's a power. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? Do you understand that's what Christ has done for you? Now, that's the first image. The second image is just as powerful. You look at the end of verse 14. He says, not only has he blotted out our sin, but it continues, he set it aside, nailing it to the cross, and it teaches us that Jesus absorbs our sin and punishment on the cross. Now, to understand this, you've, let me go back and the whole imagery of the cross and the crucifixion. And the imagery here is incredible. In the crucifixion, many of you may remember, when they rose Jesus up, you know, it says that uh, John 19, 19, it says, Pilate prepared a notice and fasted on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, there was this thing that was on top of his head, this, this, this statement. And we don't often get what that is about. Let me try to explain it, because it's what he's talking about here. See, at every crucifixion, there would be a large wooden plaque that would be placed above the, every criminal, it would be made up, and it would list the crimes for which they'd been condemned. Now, I don't know if you remember, if you remember this, but part of the story is that you know, Jesus was tried, he was condemned, and then he was marched through the street. And so if you read the record of that in the Gospels, there was this, this long progress, you know, procession, you know, that his hands were literally tied to the cross. He was led through the streets. He was you know, naked, and he was you know, beaten, and uh, he was mocked. And the reason was is that he was being led through the streets, beating and mocked. A Roman soldier would be following him with that plaque. And they would be following, and they would actually push everyone out. So when you see these images of people that were mocking Jesus and people lining out, the Roman soldiers would go before, and they would push people out of their homes and make them watch this whole spectacle. And the reason is that they wanted everyone to see what was happening, and they wanted to see, okay, see this, you know, this person was condemned for murder, this person was con condemned for, you know, for treason. Well, this is what happens to people who do this crime. And so that's why they would do this. They would do this whole thing. They would try to make it as public as possible. And then finally, when they would get there, they would, you know, put the person on the cross, and they would nail it there, and they're trying to teach people these are the crimes to avoid. Now, let's go back to John chapter 19, and verse 6. In Jesus in his trial, we're told this, is that, you know, that Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him, as for me, I find no basis of charge against him. So Pilate's saying, yes, you want him to crucify, but there isn't, he's not guilty of anything. Why should I do this? And they're saying, but still crucify him. That's why we now pick up in 1919, the one we read a moment ago, when Pilate said he prepared a you know, thing and he fastened it to the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He's saying, that's, what it, that's his crime. And he's saying, there's nothing there for me to put. I don't know what to put there. So what I'll put there is the people that think they want to be leaders of the Jews, this is what happens to them. It was really a way of getting back at the Pharisees and their accusation for Jesus. Now, here's the image. Jesus is put on the cross, but there's nothing there to put. There's no reason that he was crucified. There's nothing that he was condemned. Now, go back to Colossians chapter 2. It says, and he canceled the record of our debt that stood against us with legal demands. He set it aside. He nailed it to the cross. And here's what it's saying. The record that we wrote with our own hand, the record that condemned us, the record that pronounced us as guilty and condemned, that record 
Jesus Christ takes and he nails to the cross. There wasn't anything that he was designed, you know, guilty of. But what happens is he says, when you accept Christ, you take your record, the things that you were guilty of. And Jesus Christ comes and he takes it. And he says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to nail it on the cross. It's going to be over my head. It's right there. So you don't bear it anymore. It's not something that you carry. It's not something that you carry around. It, you say, but yeah, I was guilty, and, and the price has to be paid. The price is paid. And so often I'll talk to people who understand, you know, well, I asked Jesus to forgive my sins, but, but still. And there's the idea that, but still, I'm guilty, but still there's a price to be paid. No, you don't understand. The price is paid. Are we guilty? Do we deserve condemnation? Yes. And have we been condemned by our sins? No, Jesus was condemned for us. And the price has been paid in full. The sins are there. And anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ, you recognize that he had done nothing. There was nothing on his cross. But he was crucified and he was condemned for sins. Not his, but ours. And so that if we accept Jesus Christ and we understand what it means, they are completely paid for. Why would we continue to live with guilt? Why would we continue to live with shame? Because we feel like it hasn't been paid for in full. And what we're realizing is if you understand, number one, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then, I, then there's no hope for your guilt and shame apart from Christ. All you, anybody will do is help you learn to deal with it better. But there is a cure. And the cure isn't dealing with the effects, it's healing it at its root. And are you willing to come and say, God, I agree with you that I need to be forgiven. That's what the cross is all about. God, I come and I take the list of my failure. And God, I ask you to, to wash it clean, blot out the record. I ask you to come and take it and nail it on the cross of Jesus Christ. So that not only are my sins there, but all the full weight of condemnation is there. It's paid for completely. And if you've done that, can you believe it? Can you trust it? See, the last point when you look at this in verse 15, it's really a challenge of believing these things. First of all, have you accepted it? If you've never accepted it, there's no hope apart from Christ. You don't need to live with guilt anymore. But the only way to be freed is to trust in Jesus Christ. Only he can wash it away. Only he can obliterate it. Only he can take the sin that condemns us. If you've never trusted in Christ, I hope that this morning that you do, and today's the day that you come and say, God, I'm not trying to be good. I'm not trying to undo it. I'm not trying to work my way out of this hole. But God, I ask you to forgive me through Jesus Christ, to, to take my sin, to give me his righteousness, to blot a wall, but, you know, not only cross out, but blot out everything that I've done. And if you pray, God, I ask you to forgive me, today you can be healed. For those who have done that, the challenge is, can you believe that? Because I know that that's true, but boy, it's challenging to believe it. Look at what he says in verse 15. In all this, he says, he disarms the rulers and authorities and puts them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And what he does in, challenge, in ending is he says this, that we need to realize that we're enslaved to sin, but in Christ we're set free. When he says he's disarmed, it's a strong word. It's, he strips off, he strips away the powers and authority. It's not only the powers and authorities, it's disarming them of what? What is their authority? Their authority is sin. Their authority is guilt. So what does Satan come and do to us? What does, what does he do? He comes and condemns us. That's his authority over us. But the beautiful thing is that you've got to realize that when you trust in Jesus Christ, it destroys the authority of the evil one over us. It destroys the evil the power of, of sin over us. What does it do? It releases us from sin's penalty. That Satan and his demons, they love to carry the plaque around saying, here's all the things you did. Do you remember all this? Do you remember all the things you were condemned for? He loves to come and bury us in guilt and remorse and shame over all the things that we've done before. But Christ stripped him of that weapon. Because what he said is, no, here's the list of things. And you've got, you've got to realize that, no, I've took that and I poured my blood on it and it's washed clean. It is, it, is, it is spotless. It is without blemish. There is nothing there. That's what it says in Romans 8. You know, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through, the law, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? 
Not only that, but it says we have been released from sin's penalty, but we've been liberated from its stain. Because we sit there and we say, well, it's crossed out and, and, and I'm still aware of it. I can't remember it. Do you understand? It's not only that he blots it out, but he purifies us from the stain because he took the penalty. When we still feel guilty, we feel like we haven't paid the full price. We still owe something. And there is nothing that we owe. Was there an IOU we wrote in our own hand? Yes. Were we guilty? Yes. Did we deserve condemnation? Yes. But all that has been put on Jesus Christ. It's nailed on the cross. It's not only the sin, the condemnation, the punishment. All of that is covered. And so we are free, liberated from the stain of sin. That if you are in Christ, it says, as it said earlier in Colossians, you are holy. You are blameless. You are a child of God. You are loved. That's who you are. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? And third of all, it not only flees us from its penalty and its stain, but it also frees us from its power. When you see this, what you realize that when we are united in Christ, when we live in Christ, when our identity is in Christ, it's not that we're trying to do good to somehow earn his favor. We've been given his favor. We've been accepted. We are his children. And it frees us from its power. And so that now suddenly the things what we, before we were dead and we couldn't change, now we're made alive and we can change. When we deal with anger and we can't get past that anger or guilt, when we deal with addictions, when we deal with all these things, suddenly we're freed. We have the ability in Jesus Christ because it's not my strength, it's not me doing it, being good enough. It's me coming and saying, God, I'm not good enough. You give me what I don't have. And the power of sin that I could not defeat on my own, suddenly God defeats it. You know, that's, you want to see a beautiful picture of that? People, all the time, we'll hear people that will hear some of the testimonies, and they're like, I can't believe that people would talk about their addiction. I can't pe believe that people would talk about their past. I can't believe people would openly talk about their failures in the past. How could you do that? And you know how they can do that? Because they understand that they have been freed. They have been freed from sin's penalty, liberated from its stain, freed from its power. And they could say, you want a proof that it's freed? I can talk about it, and it no longer has any power over me. See, if we've got things we can't talk about, the fact is, it means that we haven't fully taken these truths and applied them into our lives. See, that's the beautiful thing. And when you see these pictures, when you hear these stories, what you're seeing is not this is a theory that we have. You're hearing people say, this is my reality. This is the power of the cross. This is the power of the resurrection. It takes, it takes that which is dead and it brings new life. That's what we're celebrating next week. That the fact is that Jesus Christ not only rose again from the dead 2,000 years ago, but he's raising people from the dead every day in the here and now. And he speaks into each one of our lives and says, that's what I want to do for you. And do you believe that? Will you accept that? You know, I mentioned in the beginning that we talk about this whole issue of, of, of condemnation, of guilt, and of shame. And we see it in children. I, I see it when my child hides. And they don't want to see me. They want to, because they're ashamed. But you know, I also see the picture of guilt and condemnation and forgiveness in a child. Because I come to them and I say, no, you've got to talk about it. Why? Not because I want you to be shamed. I want you to admit it so that I can heal you. And then I can hug you and I can say, I forgive you and I love you. And the relationship that they long for, that they need, this relationship with their daddy is restored. My friends, if you're here today and you've walked in and you feel that guilt and that shame, I hope and pray that you don't go another day still being haunted by those feelings. You were created for a relationship with your Heavenly Father. And he's there, and he already knows. And the question is, will we come and admit that? Will we come and say, God, here's my brokenness. Here's my guilt. Here's my shame. God, come and wash it. God, come and take it at the cross. Come, because what I want to know is that I want to know my daddy hugging me and loving me and saying, you're forgiven. And to enjoy the full freedom and blessing of that relationship I'm created for.